Hello and welcome to Global Eye with me, Parikshit Lutra. Our top story, President Xi Jinping is all set to clinch a third term at the 20th Party National Congress. This will make him the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. What makes this meeting of top Chinese leaders so important? Well, this is the most important meeting of the Chinese Communist Party that will go on for seven days in Tiananmen Square's Great Hall of People. 2,300 delegates will gather. 200 will be selected to join the Central Committee. The Central Committee will then elect 25 people to the Politburo and the Politburo will appoint members of the Politburo Standing Committee. The seven-member all-male Standing Committee, which includes Xi Jinping, the General Secretary, is the topmost decision-making body in China. Now, in the run-up, to the Party Congress. More than 70 Chinese cities have been under lockdown. There has been strict enforcement of the zero COVID strategy, despite severe economic disruptions, mind you. Police uh, in Beijing were mobilized after a rare public protest against the zero COVID strategy. We have also seen reports of increased internet censorship in the run-up to the Party Congress. The 69-year-old Xi Jinping is likely to win a third term that will further strengthen his control over the party. Xi's third term could mean a more authoritarian China. The Xi Jinping school of thought will be further enshrined in the party's constitution, according to experts. Now, under Xi's brand of Chinese socialism, we have seen a crackdown on many top Chinese companies across sectors. President Xi will open the party congress. The top leadership team will be announced. The world would be watching Xi's vision for the economy, politics, foreign policy, and climate change. Analysts across the world would like to see how China's policies over the next five years will address the economic slowdown that is going in China, the real estate sector crisis, and tech sector regulations as well. Let's open this up to our guests. We are joined by Inar Tanjun, an expert on China's political affairs, and Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, former Indian ambassador to South Korea. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining us, Inar Tanjun. Uh, what, according to you, will be the most important takeaway from this Party Congress. It is being touted as the most important meeting of the Party Congress in its history. <clears throat> well, I don't know if it's the most important, but it certainly is, uh, you know, a very important one. Uh, what you're going to see here, there's two main themes. One is uh, continuity. Uh, right now, with the kind of headwinds that are being faced uh, globally with re uh, the recession, inflation, uh, wars, conflicts, uh, you know, it, America is in disarray. Uh, it's very important to China to show a unified face, and continuity is going to be it. And that's why uh, Xi Jinping is going to get a, a very uh, big boost from the party. No one wants anyone to think that there can be divisions within it. But the second part is going to be preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and by that, I mean they have to bring on the next generation of leaders. Uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, has identified long-term goals, 2049, etc., that they want to achieve. And if you're going to do that, you need to bring on the next set of uh, leaders and prepare them. Uh, under the Chinese system, uh, they like to have uh, somebody involved for at least five years before they, uh, on the standing committee, before they can rise up uh, to take, uh, you know, one of the two top roles, either uh, premier or uh, president. So at this juncture, it's all about uh, those two issues. Uh, a lot of people talk about everything else, but the fact is this is what is the main concern uh, here in Beijing. All right. Uh, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, uh, as a former Indian diplomat, what would you be watching out for in terms of his approach to foreign policy and the world economy? Good evening. Uh, the lineup that will come up after the coronation of Emperor Xi, uh, the party congress will, uh, in fact, it's the coronation party uh, of our President Xi. After the party congress is over, uh, then the central committee, newly elected central committee would meet uh, to rubber stamp the new Politburo and the standing committee. The members of the standing committee uh, would be, it will be, that will give some indication of the direction in which China is heading. Because clearly the writ of President Xi is supreme. He is in complete command. He is in complete control. Uh, observers are quite, uh, have noted that there is no leak whatsoever about who, what the new lineup is likely to be. So that is the kind of tight control he's exercising. And it will also depend on the uh, age of the, uh, the new Politburo, uh, whether uh, uh, 
those who are in their 50s are brought in or somebody in the 60s is brought in, born in the 60s. If somebody uh, or two members or three members in the uh, standing committee are of in this uh, of born in the 60s, then uh, it will acquire a different complexion. Uh, wh whether Li Keqiang, the premier, uh, continues, does not continue. So there are, at the moment, uh, lots of speculation. The only certainty is that President Xi will be elevated as the new paramount leader. Already the Chinese media is calling him the helmsman, the people's leader, et cetera, et cetera, titles which have been associated with uh, uh, Chairman Mao. So it is a watershed moment in the Chinese history, and uh, the uh, personalized dictatorship, uh, era of personalized dictatorship of President Xi uh, will, un will, uh, will be unveiled through uh, the, after the party congress. Right. Uh, in our tangent, do you feel that there will be a change in some of the economic policies in China, especially the zero COVID strategy? It has been very disruptive. Do you think after the party congress, once he gets a unprecedented third term, things will change as far as the COVID strategy goes? No, I mean, the COVID strategy here is uh, dictated by science, uh, not politics. Uh, we've seen what happens when you try to mix politics uh, with uh, COVID. It's not pretty. So, you know, at, at this juncture, uh, they're going to follow it. Their main concern at this point is what's called long COVID. Uh, 17 million people in Europe alone have it. Uh, in the United States, 500,000 workers have been affected. Uh, they moved from the productive side of the equation to now being a drag on society because they're no longer able to be fully functional. Uh, there's real concerns when you start multiplying those numbers times the number of people uh, in China. And they're very concerned about that. They've also been a little bit remiss in terms of uh, pushing vaccines. Uh, you really need to have a, a vaccine within the last six months to have it uh, be uh, very effective. After six months, it's probably time to get a booster. Uh, I imagine that once they uh, start embarking on a serious uh, vaccine drive, um, then you'll know that that's the time when things will open up. I can tell you this, that throughout China right now, they're building intensive care wards, uh, not just in the cities, uh, second, third, fourth tier cities, but even in uh, large villages. Uh, and this, you know, obviously they're building these so that they can handle an influx of uh, people if in fact they do get sick. They've also acquired uh, medicines that will allow them to treat people who um, decide not to have the vaccine uh, and uh, you know, get sick. Uh, they want to take care of these people. Remember, you, you can say what you want about uh, China, but they have protected their people the best of any nation in the world, uh, regardless of size, uh, if you start looking at the mortality rates and the number of people who caught it. Right. Uh, Ambassador Prakash, uh, to come to you right now, when it comes to India-China relations, a lot of the global media reports, the Western media reports, have been saying that we will see a more authoritarian China. So do you feel that issues such as the dispute at the Indochina border, we will expect President Xi to take a harder stand, a tougher stand? Well, let us, let us see what he has done so far. Uh, during 10 years of his rule, there have been increasing number of standoffs. And uh, the frankly, the way they went about violating and tearing up all the CBA confidence building measures, the agreements, uh, and the commitments that were given in 14 meetings with Prime Minister Modi uh, in, is indicative of the kind of uh, disposition that President Xi Jinping has. Not only with India, uh, China has today is at odds with most of its neighbors, and uh, the kind of aggressive policies that are being followed are are uh, boomeranging, or uh, there is a pushback. So uh, now the question is whether he it will be business as usual in that he will want to take on uh, any and everybody, or there will uh, there is likely to be some change. Uh, we are not betting on any change because it, it would appear that once all restraints on him are off and he is, he is basically a authoritarian leader and uh, the expectation, the general belief is that he, without any restrictions on him now, 
he will push take even a more aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in his all his neighbors including india and we are prepared for that right so you're saying we will uh, possibly see a tougher president xi jinping uh, let me get it in our tangent once again in our uh, the kind of issues that we see facing the Chinese economy right now, the real estate crisis, the slowdown in the economy, do you think uh, and does uh, the Chinese media also believe that there will be hints for an economic roadmap uh, in his opening speech at the party congress? Um, there will be a talk. The party is more about uh, setting goals. Uh, the government itself, uh, there will be a, another meeting in March mm -hmm. to have an actual government report. Here, they, they will have a party report. They will be talking about how well they have done against the benchmarks they set uh, previously. Uh, they'll go for it. It's a very uh, you know, thorough report. And they talk about areas where they need to improve and things like that. So they don't um, think that uh, Xi Jinping is going to make a major policy speech uh, at this juncture. It's possible, but it doesn't seem consistent with their idea of, of continuity, of trying to uh, you know, face up to all these headwinds, as you've heard from um, my colleague, the ambassador. Uh, he takes a very dim view of China, uh, sees things in the veil of a strongman politics. I can tell you that having written books on Chinese city and government, uh, that's not the way it works. It's a much more of a consensus uh, uh, situation. Uh, and you can see that in the way that uh, China goes about uh, dealing with RCEP and all of these SCO, et cetera. It is not about, uh, you know, like the U.S. saying, I have a veto, I can do this, I can do that, you have to be under my thumb. Uh, to the contrary, uh, they invite people in, like under the SCO, they invited Pakistan and India in, knowing that it was not going to be easy, uh, but not trying to push. Hmm. All right, uh, we seem to be losing that link within our tangent, but uh, we've also come to the end of this discussion. Ambassador Prakash, thank you very much for joining us here on this program, giving us a sense of uh, the 20th Party Congress and why it's also important for India to take cues from President Xi Jinping's speech there. Uh, we're going to take a short break at this point, but coming up on the other side, we shift our focus to the ongoing protests in Iran. We will be joined by Kameen Mohammadi, journalist, writer, and uh, also Percy's Kareem. Don't go anywhere. That's coming up on the other side. As gunfire and protests continue across the streets of Iran, the anti-hijab protests are being seen as the most serious challenge to the Iranian authorities in decades. The protests were prompted by the death of 22-year-old Mahesa Amini in police custody. Amini was reportedly beaten up by Iran's so-called morality police for not wearing a hijab properly. She died in a hospital three days later, according to Iran's human rights group. More than 200 people, including 23 children, have died so far in the protests. However, the government has denied killing any protesters, even as people upload videos of police firing on the streets. To take this forward, I'm now joined by Kameen Mohammadi, writer and journalist, and Percy's Kareem, chair and director at Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies, uh, joining us from San Francisco. Uh, Percy's Kareem, I'd like to ask you about these protests. Do you think, and we've widely read that these are unprecedented, there have been protests over the last two decades, nothing of this kind. Will this force a regime, uh, changes in the Iranian regime and uh, their approach to women's rights? Uh, well, I think one of the things that we don't know is where this is going. And part of it is that this is a unique moment in the history of the world to see this many people out on the streets and to not have a, a leader that is identifiable. It's a, it's a spontaneous um, effort on behalf of the people of Iran. And I want to point out that it's also the Kurdish people who have paid a very high price um, inside of Iran. The thing that makes this a very unique protest is that it's led largely by women. Men have joined in, of course, but it was started uh, by the death of Masa Amini in police custody. And in a way, her death is the spark for many other grievances against the Islamic Republic. 
And I think what's important to point out is that this is one of many protests that have occurred over the last 20 years, as you point out. But there have been many attempts to reform uh, the laws, especially the discriminatory laws against women over the years, and that failed. And many people feel that voting failed, that there has been little opportunity for Iranians to address their frustration. And then, of course, the economic situation in Iran as a result of sanctions, COVID, is another sort of fuel for what's happening on the streets. So I think while it's fundamentally about discrimination and what we call gender apartheid in Iran, there are many more people joining in because they see the, the regime as failing to address the people's needs and also the um, absolute frustration with the repression that has occurred over and over again over the last 40 years. Um, any dissent is not tolerated. And of course, these protests were met with violence in 2019, in 2009. Um, so it's not uh, unique that they're they're meeting out particular violence okay. towards these protesters. What's right. unique is that people are resisting in an unprecedented scale. Okay. Uh Absolutely. We have been seeing that happen, not just in Iran, across the world as well. Uh, Kameen Mohammadi, if I can get you in at this stage. Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, has blamed US and Israel for orchestrating these protests. Uh, he's made it clear that these protests will be dealt with severely. Do you think the Iranian leadership this time will be able to control these protests with a heavy hand? Um, that's a good question. I. I think that they will try, and I think that what we have ahead of us is grim, because the, historically you can see that the Iranian regime hasn't been particularly shy about um, about you know turning its brute force onto protesters. And the Green Wave movement of two thousand and nine, where which was organised, which did have leadership, uh, all the things that, as Persis said doesn't seem to exist with this um, this particular set of protests. Um, it took them seven months to really effectively quash that movement. It wasn't just about the, the, the arrests and the killing in the moment. This That was an operation, you know, where they swept through anybody who had any connections, any links. So can they do it? <sighs> They have the ability, I assume, but what, what is unique about these protests is that in spite of this, people are not going home. And I think um, what we're hearing is that the forces, the security forces are getting very exhausted. They're getting tired. You know, this has been going on for a month now. Um, we're seeing anecdotally also some members of the police joining the protesters. We're hearing also that um, they don't necessarily want to turn this sort of violence and brute force against their own people. So certainly they can, whether they will. Um, of course, this regime has not ever really dealt with dissent in any way other than to kill, jail, and and goodness knows what else. I mean, we've heard that um, a lot of the young people, the young girls who are being taken, mm. and the average age, I want to say this, of those being arrested is 15. Um, they're taking them to, you know, mental institutions for re-education. So it's a, it's very dark outlook. Hmm. Right. Uh, of course, a very dark outlook there. Uh, Percy Kareem, just to uh, bring you in once again, do you think the sanctions, the international pressure uh, at this stage is going to work on uh, the Iranian regime? Or do you think if any change can be brought out, it can only be brought out by, by the Iranian women right now. Well, we know that the sanctions are part of what has brought people to this moment. Um, the crushing inflation that has occurred inside of Iran is certainly part of people's frustration with their own government. Um, I don't know how many more sanctions can be levied against the Iranian state. It's pretty pretty sanctioned already. Um, I think that my feeling is that 
it's likely that the people of Iran will determine the fate of their country themselves at a very high price. Um, and that, in a sense, what they're responding to is the way that the regime is perceived by the outside world is also how they themselves perceive it, perceive it as an oppressive regime, and that they have tried to compromise and uh, reform it without success. So I don't know that the sanctions or further sanctioning, I know that, you know, the IR. GC was already sanctioned, now the morality police, but will that actually have any effect economically? I, I seriously doubt that will determine this regime staying or going. Um, I think really it's about people's will right. to affect um, some fissures inside of the establishment. Um, we've already seen a little bit of that as uh, mm. Kamin Mohammadi said, but also, I think uh, if there begins to be more killing of girls, of children, which there already has been, mm. um, as we know from the young women who've been killed already by at the hands of okay. security forces, if there continues to be that kind of um, response, I think it will really determine what happens in terms of any disagreements at the highest levels of this regime. Okay, uh, my final question to Kameen Mohammadi. We're, we're running out of time on this program, but uh, Kameen Mohammadi, if I were to ask you, what are you really hoping for will come out after these protests conclude? And the Iranian diaspora, how are they supporting the people on the ground? We're hearing about internet crackdowns as well. So at a time like this, people like you how are you supporting uh, the Iranian women and uh, young students on the ground? It's a really great question. Um, the, our hopes, uh, you know, the, the longer the process go on, the more hope we have of some kind of lasting change. But I suppose in the first instance, while there is hope in seeing that people are taking some power and taking some space, and women particularly are saying no, enough. Um, and that's unbelievably inspiring to see our people really lose the fear, you know, of the regime. But, but I suppose we all see lots of bloodshed ahead because we know how this regime is. What can we do in the diaspora? We can help to bring attention to, and we can help to amplify the voices that are actually coming out of Iran. I think it's really important for us not to impose our narrative and our desires onto what's going on there, but as best as we can support the people of Iran. And I think mostly what we can do is give them sort of moral support. You know, these hashtags are followed. Um, Iranians are, are, are massively on social media, 80% of the population. Of course, we hear about internet um, going down. Yes, people are sending VPNs, they're sharing ways for people inside Iran to circumvent. So, you know, you need to also be careful because at the same time, while the regime is blaming the West, of course, any involvement from the West is only going to make things more difficult for the people on the ground. So. I just keep saying this to people. I know it feels really little, but keep on okay. speaking about it. Amplify the voices. Mm. Let everybody know what's going on. You know, right. let the regime know that the world is watching. Okay. And let the people of Iran know that their bravery right. is not being ignored. It's not going unmarked. I think knowing that the world is supporting right. them it's really, it's really important. Um, yeah. They're the ones on the ground. They're the ones that are going to need the bravery, mm. the stamina. Um, I think the best that we can do is just okay. keep drawing attention, you know, to their cause, to Mohammadi. what is going on, and try to explain right. and contextualize it. This is right. what we're doing, right? We're trying. Absolutely. We're coming on programs like yours to try and give Absolutely. some to flesh out really what's going on because we're running out of time. You know, Kameen there's a Mahmoudi, lot that people don't. But it was know. it was really beautiful talking to you. Yeah, it was beautiful talking to you and Persis uh, Kareem. We've run out of time, unfortunately, but we'll keep this conversation here on Global Eye on CNBC TV 18 because uh, 
Uh, this is a story that the world has been watching very closely and our thoughts and prayers with uh, the Iranian women and children on the ground there. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Globalize. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.